This morning we're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off a couple weeks ago. It's glad to see everybody here this morning. Again, today is we're going to be celebrating 25 years of Barnstone Ministries. Um, the one thing that we are thankful for and we have to remember is we will never see the effect on people that we encounter throughout our lifetime that God uses through us. And that's where we have to leave it, lay at his feet, doing the best that we can to present the gospel of Jesus Christ and leaving it there, okay? And if we get the opportunity to follow up with people or keep friendship with people or keep in communication with people, that is a blessing, that is wonderful. But a lot of times, uh, the church, I hate to dare say, has a revolving door. And it's just like your life. If you take your life and put it on a train, you have people coming in and out and off, in and off of the train. Some people leave good things. Some people deposit bad things. The ones that leave and deposit bad things, we're happy when they leave the train. As a matter of fact, sometimes we help them and open the door for them. So, but it's just, it's, on some, it's sort of on the same principle that we have to remember that God uses us for his purpose and his glory. So a couple weeks ago, we were in, uh, we're still in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 5, and we read through verses 1 through 21. I'm not going to repeat myself. I'm not going to read all of that again. So for anybody that hasn't read it, read it later, read it tonight. Go on YouTube, YouTube channel, Go to Barn, in the search, Barnstone Ministries. We will be the big B, the blue B, I think it is. Uh, click on it, and then you will see uh, the, uh, the services that we posted there. And I was on there yesterday, and amazingly enough, I, I think we have 60. We have 60 videos on YouTube, okay? I, I couldn't believe it was that many. But if you go back a few weeks, I have them posted as dates. So if you go back a few weeks, you'll start here and then you can get caught up. But what we did was we took Ephesians 5, we read 1 through, uh, 1 through 21, and there's a list that Paul writes. It's the don'ts and the do's, okay? So we have six don'ts and we have ten do's. Now the six don'ts are sexual immorality, covetousness, filthiness, no association with sinful behavior, works of darkness, drunk with wine. And then the do's, we have imitate God, walk in love, walk as children of light, discern what pleases God, walk as wise, make the best use of time, be filled with the Spirit, address one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, give thanks, and submit to one another. So now we have this list, but the question would be, what, what do we do now? What, you know, how, how, how are we going to do this list? How do we actually go forth and, and take and, and live our lives with this do nots and do's? And, I, and a question popped up and it's like, how many of you started, so how many of you stopped writing after the first few because you got tired of it? the do's and don'ts, and you're like, whoa, this list is way too long. And if you think this list is long, this is what I would encourage you to do. Go back and start at Genesis and just read the first five books. Now, the first five books, okay? Otherwise, in Hebrew, known as the Torah, in Greek, the Pentateuch. These are the books that we believe Moses wrote. And just to give you a heads up, there's over 600 Laws, do's, and don'ts. So if you think this little 16 list is major, um, go back. As a matter of fact, here's what I'll have you do. Go ahead and go home today and start reading in Genesis. Read all the way to Revelation. And then keep a running list of do's and don'ts. Can I tell you, you're probably going to want to gouge your eyes out by the time you're there because there's just so many. But how do we do I mean, how, how is this going to be accomplished? Because how am I going to keep on doing what I should be doing 
and I don't do what I shouldn't be doing. Because even Paul himself makes the comment about himself, I do what I shouldn't be doing, and I don't do what I should be doing. Well, again, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit given unto Paul, he puts it right here at the beginning of this chapter. If you look at Ephesians 5, verse 1, he puts, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. You see, this is what we have to grasp as part of our identity, that we are adopted by God the Father. You know how we're going to do what's right and not do what's wrong? It's not by getting focused on ourselves. It's by getting focused on our Father. As he says in Ephesians 5, 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. That sounds good, doesn't it? I think that sounds great. That we are beloved children. Christians are beloved children of God. And he says at the end of Ephesians 5, 20, he says that God is our Father. So here's our identity. If you're a Christian, God's our Father, and we are beloved children. He already told us that in Ephesians 1, 5, at the beginning of the book, that we've been adopted. You ever see someone get adopted? Have you? I mean, I know that um, around our area, we had the Bear Foundation who adopted, who uh, set up foster children and everything. And, and I have to honestly say, that's probably one of the happiest moments I can imagine of a kid to get adopted, to have a family, to not feel so isolated, feel so alone. And so that's what our relationship with God is. It's a relationship with God as Father. And this would have been revolutionary talk. This, this is something in Paul's day that, that is really something that was hard to comprehend and accept. I have to give you a little bit of history lesson on, on Paul's day. Now, please forgive me because this isn't pretty. But did it happen? Yes. And unfortunately, it's horrific. Okay? So, in Paul's day, the Roman Empire was in control. All right? And there were kids that were born particularly in poor families, when a girl was born, that girl was gone. That girl was left out. Maybe back up a little bit. It has been said that, first off, that they never named their children until they were a week old. Because they didn't know whether they were going to live or die. After a week, they gave them a name. But if they decided to keep them, they kept them. But unfortunately, a lot of them were put out like trash. If you had maybe a boy, and that boy was deformed in some way, the chances of that boy living were nil. Whether it was taken by the Lord, or it was taken by man's hand. And so you have these children that were put out like trash. And you have other people that are coming along and they would pick these children up. Now, these aren't moral individuals. They would do ridiculous things with girls. They would put the guys or the, the, the men in the gladiator pit. And this is what happened in Paul's day. So to have the thought of having a father was not common. It was something just new, it was different. But eventually, when Christianity started, what they would do 
is they would literally go out and they would find these children. And they would take them in. And they would adopt them. They would care for them. They'd watch after them. So, as this progressed, that's where the idea of us being adopted by Christ. I'm going to get ahead of myself. I just want to say this one statement. And if you're writing anything down, write this down. Your theology informs your activity. Okay? Your theology informs your activity. So, without Christ, without being a Christian, those children that are out in the street, you probably would think that it's none of my business. I have my own problems. I have my own issues. But now that you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and you're a follower of Christ, now your theology gives you a different perspective on your activity. Oh, we need to take care of those children. We need to give them the people that we either adopt them or we find homes for them. How many of you would agree with me if I made this statement? Jesus Christ was adopted. Pretty good thing, though, huh? If he was adopted, Albert, how the heck can he be adopted? That doesn't make any sense. Who was Joseph? Joseph was an earthly father. Joseph adopted him. So Jesus himself was adopted. And if Jesus is adopted, adopted, then adoption is good. Not only was Jesus adopted, but through Jesus were adopted. And if God's our Father, and through Jesus were adopted into God's family, then we should be adopting children into our family. We should be mothers and fathers to them and telling them that we adopted them because the Father in heaven has adopted us. It's why Christians have always loved adoption. See, God's heart is a father's heart. God's heart is an adoptive heart. And I want you to see salvation as adoption. Who makes the decision that children are the father in an adoption? Who makes that decision? The father does. A child isn't going to go down to the courthouse and fill out all the paperwork and say, I want them. No, the father decides who will adopt. And it's a legal transaction. So it is with us. God's a father who adopts his kids. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower after him, he picked you. He picked you to be his son or daughter. He adopted you into his family. You now bear the family name of Christian. You now receive all the inheritance rights of, inheritance rights of the Father. And that includes the totality of the kingdom of God. You've heard us said, you've heard it said from up here before, that when you enter any place, whenever you're around, you represent the kingdom of God. And the people that see you, that interact with you, that might be the only time they will ever see a Jesus. They will ever see Jesus. They will ever see the kingdom of God. Because you're there representing them. We also need to realize that our Heavenly Father has a wound. And the Father's wound is deep. Now, these are numbers from 2021. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 18.4 million children, that's one out of four, that's one in four, live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. Just think of it this way. That fills New York. That fills Los Angeles four times. What that means is 
Now, the majority of children grow up have no father. The majority of children have no father, and many who do have a bad dad, a violent dad, an abusive dad, an unloving dad, a dad who will not protect or will not provide. And I think as much as anything, it articulates, it explains, it encapsulates the brokenness that we see in our culture. It's the result of a bunch of bad dads. I've said this before. There was a Gallup poll many, many years ago, and it talked about um, Christianity and the family, that if the teenager went to youth group, accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they came back to the house and they lived a life that was Christian or following Christ, the, res the end result or the probability of the rest of the family accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior and following him was around 15 to 20%. If the mother accepted Jesus Christ and she followed Jesus, the probability of the rest of the family raised up to about 35 to 40%. However, the father, if the father accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that probability goes straight to 85 to 90%. You see, the result is today that people who are in their teens and 20s, they're, they're lost. They don't know why or where they came from, why they're here, where they're going, or what they're doing. It means in the church, a lot of what we call discipleship is really parenting. If we have, if we are blessed with young people in the church. We do more parenting than we do discipleship of the Lord. You have to teach them, here's how you get a job. Here's how you take care of your finances. Here's how you, um, you date in court. Here's how you get married. Here's how you govern your sexuality. Here's how you raise a kid. And today, discipleship is really parenting. And in the absence of intact families and homes, the church becomes the family of God that is there to help make the difference. So as we read this list from our Heavenly Father of don't do this and do that, all of that is to be learned in community with the family. And one of the things that is discouraging it's distressing, it's devastating, is that the average person views God like their earthly father treated them. There's a writer by the name of uh, Christian Smith. And a, he's, he's a known uh, sociologist. Uh, he did a big study about teenagers in their 20-somethings, uh, spiritual, spiritually speaking. And in the history of the United States of America, he's written two books. And his basic summary is that the average young adult believes in something called moralistic, therapeutic deism. Big words. Well, the deism gives, it means God lives far away. He's not really involved in our life. The moralistic, he wants us to be good people. The therapeutic, so we should take whatever we could find in psychology, sociology, and anthropology, and theology, and spirituality, and just grab some tricks and some tips so that we can live a better, more satisfying, happy life. You see, that view of God is like their earthly father. He left. He doesn't know me. He does, he's not here to help me. He hopes I do my best. And maybe once in a while, we get a check in the mail. The view of God in the Bible is absolutely different than the view of God in culture. You see, in the Bible, God is Father. And I need you to know that. I need you to believe that. Have that faith that God 
is your father. Some of us, this is truth that is going to take a while to penetrate the hardness of our heart. Once you understand that identity, you see, it changes your activity. So the key to don't do this and do that is to ask, who's my father? If that's my father, then I do what I behave. I do what to behave this way. I want to behave this way. I don't want to behave that way. And that's why how Paul summarizes it by saying, be imitators of God as dearly loved children of God. And that's his thesis statement. See, little kids who have a dad who absolutely adores them want to be like their dad. Little boys who have a father that they interact with, that father interacts and loves them and raises them. That little boy, as is growing up, wants to be like his dad. But that little girl, as she's loved by her dad and encouraged by her dad and helped by her dad, she wants to marry someone who's like her dad. I told Julie a long time ago, I'm not your father. I'm not going to be anywhere near your dad because your father can work me under the table. God bless him. The man is 82, 81 years old, and he's a goer. Never sits still. When he sits down, he's going to sleep. I told her, I said, sorry, sweetheart. Not me. I'll do my best. So the change in activity and behavior really starts with the change in identity. You see, it's a father issue. You know why I don't want to do that, or I do want to do that, it's because my dad loves me. And I want to be like my dad. And if my dad should tell me no, it must be because it's a bad thing. Because I know that my dad is a good man. So some of you come to the Bible, and you're not sure that God is a, is a good, loving, committed father. When he says no, you're like, I want to argue. I want to debate. I want to disagree. <clears throat> what age group does that sound like? I want to argue. I want to debate. I want to challenge. I want to disagree. You sound like an immature teenager. It's amazing how much we realize our parents grew up when we hit our 20s. Boy, they knew a lot. You see, if you know that your father loves you, and that he's good, and he tells you the truth, and that he's there to protect you, and he's always, he's always seeking your good. If your dad comes along and says, please don't do that, you say, okay. I don't fully understand but I'll, I will trust you. And I know that you're always seeking my good. So I'm going to live my, by faith and trust that. And as I walk in that, then eventually it'll become sight. And I'll see that you're talking about. And then I see what you're talking about. You see, as dearly loved children of God, we need to imitate our father. And we need to remember, we are adopted by God, our father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, as I come before you and I think of all the, all the, all the memories that I had with my earthly father and thinking back and just saying, you know, please forgive me. I, I was I, I was not a very good son. But at the end of all things, he was trying to protect me, to teach me. And Lord, as I walked with you, I did the exact same things. Father, I pray that I've come to that knowledge. I pray I've come to that place in my life where now it is Yes, Dad. 
Yes, Father. I know that you want good for us. Because that's who you are. And I know I might be speaking out of turn, but I would believe that all of us in this room could probably say the same thing. That there are times in our walk with you where we were rebellious. Where we argued, where we didn't like the decision. We didn't like the outcome of whatever we were praying for. But Father, we need to have the faith in you that you are just, that you are fair, that you are loving, that you are protecting, and that you know best. You know what is right for us. So please forgive us for being rebellious, for being argumentative. Please forgive us for when we've turned away from you and walked away from you. Help us in our faith, strengthen our faith in you. Truly thank you for adopting us into your kingdom and for allowing us to call you Father. We truly want to bless and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.